administration. Greetings, everyone. We had to do a little bit of shuffling around in order to make all this work, but uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome you all to the 24th Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings uh, event uh, that uh, is featuring a fireside chat on the topic of Asian American Career Ceilings Achieving set Success in Architecture. Uh, just before I introduce uh, our panelists, uh, I want to give you a little bit of history. <clears throat> this, uh, this series was started uh, about three years ago uh, by the Committee 100 because there was a feeling that there was a serious issue with regard to Asian Americans, not in terms of their getting into good schools uh, and joining companies, but somehow in the mid ranks, uh, they would stall in their career and, uh, uh, and would not succeed. And it's not just uh, something related to one industry or another, it's really uh, true for many, many industries. Um, now, uh, we've had speakers from different industries. We had a group of millennials. We had prominent researchers who have done studies and could show us data about uh, what the problem is and why. It's been a wonderful uh, three years. And we've also had some brainstorming sessions where we had um, 100 people really get together in groups and trying to come up with new ideas and also ideas how to make certain activities work better. Uh, and we're moving more and more towards action-oriented uh, uh, events uh, and, and activities. And any of you who would like to volunteer and be involved with the group of volunteers who work on this, uh, please uh, let us know. Uh, so with that though, um, it's very interesting. We're very, we're very pleased to have two leading Asian American uh, architects here, Mark Lee, who is the chair of the Department of Architecture at, at Harvard's uh, Graduate School of Design. He's also a principal and a, and a founding partner of the architecture firm Johnson Markley. And uh, I also have uh, Calvin Tsao, who is a partner and founder of the architecture firm of Tsao and McCowan. And he's also, like myself, uh, a Committee 100 uh, member. Um, we are going to take about an hour uh, and I'm going to just lead these, uh, our two panelists through a set of questions. Uh, they know that questions advance. I might throw in a surprise one here and there <laughs> just to keep, uh, keep all of you, uh, you know, honest. Uh, and we're going to make sure that we leave some time at the end for Q and A from you in the audience. We had 296 people register, 97 people register for this event. So there's clearly uh, high interest. Uh, the other uh, thing I do want to mention, though, is uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Committee of 100, but those of you who are not, uh, the Committee of 100 was founded about 34 years ago by Ian Pei, Yo-Yo Ma, Oscar Tang, Henry Tang, and, and a number of uh, prominent Chinese Americans, really at the suggestion of Henry Kissinger, who said that we ought to gather a group of diverse uh, and successful Chin Chinese Americans to try to tackle uh, issues in two groups. One, uh, the domestic issues uh, related to the needs of the, uh, of the community, a, a Chinese American community, whether it's discrimination or otherwise, or, or cultural. And the other was a better uh, understanding in a nonpartisan, non-political way between China and the US. And I've been very proud of the activities of the Committee 100 uh, over the last 34 years. We're having our annual meeting and gala uh, on May 4th, 5th, I believe, uh, in uh, California. And it's not too late to sign up uh, if you're interested in attending. So let me start out with uh, our two, uh, two panelists here. And uh, what I'd like to do is start out if each of you just take a couple of minutes uh, and briefly tell the audience about your career history and what you do today. So. Uh, I'll start. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Peter. Delighted to do the conversation with you and Kelvin. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in Hong Kong. Actually, many of my steps followed Kelvin, but a few years later. <laughs> uh, and then I was that generation who left in the early 80s, uh, not long after 
the fact of then shipping a visit and the confirm Hong Kong and go back to China. A lot of uh, friends of my generation were sent to the US or other Commonwealth countries. And I did two years of high school in California before enrolling in USC to study architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, the first couple of years there were, took me a long time to get acclimated. I struggled with it. Didn't find my calling until I was in architecture school. So um, after five years, uh, Los Angeles became home. I worked for a couple of years, and then I went to uh, graduate school of design as a, to get my master's degree. I then moved to Switzerland, lived there for a few years in Zurich, had my first teaching job there. Moved back to LA, always LA has always been home. Uh, started my own practice with my partner. Uh, started teaching at UCLA, taught there for 10 years, always been involved in academia and, and the profession at the same time until I became, I took on the chair position at the GSD um, five years ago. So now I'm by coastal between Cambridge and LA. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know a lot of people who go to yours have gone yeah. to your school mm -hmm. and a lot of well-known uh, architects. Um, Calvin. Well, um, as you know, I was uh, one of Ian Pei's staff or my, he, he gave me my second job, the first job with, with, with Richard Meyer. Um, I do really share the same background as, <laughs> as, as Mark. I was born in Hong Kong. I left, but a little earlier, I was only 12, and I moved to California. Um, I have to say that, that I was a good few decades before you. I, I arrived in, 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 in the United States at a time of the flower power generation. And it just like totally blew me away that there's all these opportunities I never thought a very uh, you know orderly uh, colonial education had provided me. And uh, it freaked my parents out, of course. And I actually didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to Berkeley, so that really encouraged me not to know. <laughs> And I took no offense to Berkeley people <laughs> in the audience. I was a compliment. <laughs> it, and I would say it was the foundational to my life ahead, which all my professors and counselors advised me to find myself. And one of them was actually in the theater. And I actually only took a few courses in architecture, and I actually went to graduate school in the theater. But speaking of career ceilings, that was the first time I I confronted a stumbling block because I went to Carnegie Mellon in graduate school and in theater, and I wanted to be an actor. And they said, you know, I don't think there are many roles out there for, for you. Maybe voiceovers, maybe commercials, but maybe you should consider directing or something in behind the scenes. And I, that's not what I was interested in, but uh, I went. I would actually happened to have gone to visit my sister at Wellesley, her boyfriend at the time was a GSD student who said, hey, you know, I think you could, you could fit well, you know, we can start all over again. There's just three and a half year program where with, for people without a background. And I know you can draw and do all that stuff. And I got in. <laughs> so I backed into architecture, you know, <laughs> accidentally. And, uh, and then of course I graduated um, and got a job at Richard Myers, who's now canceled. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and then I was offered a job at Iron Pays and the rest was was history because he really inspired me. He put me on a job to and sent me to China uh, to do the first ever uh, foreign commission that China is doing to uh, and of course to I am and in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And then the Bank of China building in Hong Kong. So I spent a lot of time back to Hong Kong. Um, and so on and so forth. And here I am. Yeah. Well, you have to say, amongst many of the things I'm, I'm envious of you, Calvin, is working with Ian Pei. I remember um, as, a, as a youngster, um, at that time, I think two of the most prominent Chinese Americans were Ian Pei and Anne Lang. You know, right. That's an international reputation. And then I knew I'm not so much of a computer engineer. So <laughs> the architecture is the past. <laughs> So let's get started. Uh, you know, it's interesting when we were thinking about how we should do this panel, one of the challenges, which is true for many professions, is there's not just one architecture industry. It's actually, you can have all sorts of different jobs and different types of companies. They're large corporations, they're partnerships, they're a whole slew of things. And then of course, there are 
the uh, departments within large companies where the main business may be computers, but they have people who practice essentially architecture within it. Uh, so what it makes challenging is to say, well, okay, different careers in these different, uh, you know, different segments of the industry, but uh, could you, you know, uh, could you describe maybe the different organizational industry segments that you think are relevant to the audience when they think about this issue of their career and how to be successful? And obviously, there are a million examples, but maybe think of a couple that are worth mentioning and what to mention about that segment or that structure is relevant to this question about career seedings. Either one of you, whichever order you wish. Um, I'll start. I mean, I think, you know, in my own practice is a relatively small practice. is also pretty much a niche practice that we really work with in the arts. So that's one type of practice out there. But there are also much larger offices. You know, I think early in my career when I was a student or when I just got out of school, I worked with larger offices. Um, I don't know if Big Bad Blue was as big as Cave at that time, but I remember back then, um, it was much more compartmentalized in different departments. I would say back then, the Asians that were in those offices tend to be more um, technically driven. Oftentimes, they're in that not many, many of them that were in the foreground. A lot of them were in the doing construction, documentation, engineering. I would, I'm generalizing, but a lot of them are kind of quiet. You know, there are very few of them that were design leader, certainly in history, we look back, there were in LA, there's Jim Wong from Pereira, there's uh, Gio Obata, I know, uh, Bill Louie from KPF, right. one of those. But those at that time were quite rare, I would say. Not that there were not any Asians in those larger offices, but oftentimes they were more um, stereotyped or more like, relegated to uh, background. By larger office, you're saying just larger architectural firms? Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah. You're not talking about a, a large corporation or a government? Um, no, no, no. Larger architecture, sometimes architecture and engineering or architecture and interior, but a, a large architecture firms, I'd say 300 to 500 people. Yeah, 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 that's true. Um, well, the wonderful thing about architecture is that that's really a broad, broad spectrum, right? Yeah. And so I would say for anyone who is looking to the profession, the first thing you'd say is what, what is it that you are strong in? What is your passion? You can be a technical person, there's nothing embarrassing about that. I think the idea of celebrity architect, meaning that you know if that's the only kind of architecture there is, it's not. As long as you do something that you agree, then that's fine. Um, I think so. That's a way you find your particular niche. You can be an engineer, I mean, engineering focused, or you can be design focused, or you can be service focused, or you can be socially served for service, and you can go quite specific into niches. There are firms that are into these days housing only or or or, or institutional work right. and so if you believe that you really want to do public good you can go there uh, you want to be really look at architecture as an art is an art form then you can go there uh, i think both of us went into pretty much architecture as an art form and i think both of us also believe that it's also a social service yeah, that we do do uh, we have a responsibility to advance culture and society and social good. Um, but that's by no means the only way to practice. And I, I would say that, uh, uh, and you're saying that you know you have you can go forward for a large corporate office or you can start small. I think that if you start, it's always good to have experience in a big, big uh, professional office where you learn the ropes. A to Z, because schools don't always teach you everything, yeah. uh, and uh, professional practice is an important part of the learning. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you can stay and find your place, work mm -hmm. yourself up, like build, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where you can become a partner, uh, and, or you can jump out like we do and start our own little firm, very specific to what we like to do that we don't want to be strapped by a bigger agenda mm -hmm. by a bigger uh, company mm -hmm. so actually that's one of the advantages of architecture because you know there's some industries you want to be in the automotive industries there's no such thing as a two-person automotive yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And a partner so you can't say well let's partner together and I think it's, there's a scale issue yeah uh, i guess what you're saying is in architecture uh, 
there's a freedom not only in terms of size, mm -hmm. but also what the focus and emphasis of yeah. the firm is. Mm -hmm. So you can you can pick and choose. Mm -hmm. And it sounds also like you're saying is you got to start out knowing yourself. Correct. Because yeah. if you don't know yourself, you can't match your. Yeah. If you don't know yourself well, then and you, your your loves and needs mm -hmm. are what you're good at. You can't match yourself. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if you have good information. I think that's the first thing you have to do is be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Then you have people. Then you can blame other people for having a career ceiling, but otherwise you're putting a ceiling on yourself. You don't know, right? Yeah. But having said that, I don't think when it comes to ceilings, though, mm -hmm. that's a very tricky issue. I think yeah. I think when you work with big offices, I don't know. We mm -hmm. we didn't go that direction, yeah. but I can see where these conventional prejudices mm -hmm. perceptions may occur. Yeah. Uh, such as like there's also a perception that China, Asians, particularly mm -hmm. Chinese, I think they may not think that of the Japanese or Koreans these days, that we're pragmatic somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you look, if you look across, because obviously the two of you are very familiar with all the many of the different architectural firms, if you look across the ones, particularly the larger ones, do you perceive that that, that somehow the numbers or the, the the practices are that Asian Americans don't rise at the top uh, in, in proportion, right, mm -hmm. to the ones that actually go into architecture, mm -hmm. or or maybe not. What do you feel? I think the ones that I'm most familiar with are the ones that are on the coast, you know, and I think that's much easy, there are much more examples where Asian Americans do rise to the top. Mm -hmm. I, I can speak for many of the others, but the in terms of the coast of New York and Los Angeles, yeah. I feel there are a lot more opportunities yeah. than say 20 years ago. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the presence of Asian yeah. Americans are much more, uh, much larger than before. I think there's a sea change happening. Yeah. I think even there's yeah. a big difference between you and my generation because mm -hmm. when I was in school, mm -hmm. there were only four, four out of 35 students in my class. Yeah. There are Asian and two, yeah. two Chinese, one Japanese. Two Japanese, sorry, two Japanese, two Chinese. Mm -hmm. That's it. But I would like to focus on the ceiling that's actually not necessarily career. I find my ceiling was for my family, mm -hmm. where they feel that, yeah. you know, you should get a real job <laughs> somehow. Yeah, yeah. So they had a bias against architecture. Yeah. So, yeah. So, when you be a doctor or something <laughs> like that. Or, I think less so today yeah. because you can see now, you know, they're. Lots of fashion designers, yeah. they're actors now, finally. That Oscar is mm -hmm. Oscar, right? Yes, yeah. that hey, we push through, and a lot of it has to do with actually, first hurdle is your own family, yeah. and they acted out of love for sure. Yeah. But you know, that's why I say you do need to really find your own core passion, what you want to do, mm -hmm. because you have to push through so many doors. You know, that's an interesting point because in some of the previous. You know, panels that we've had, mm -hmm. that issue has come up, which mm -hmm. is are are there some self created obstacles, mm -hmm. either by the individuals themselves or by their families? Yeah. And and also, I think your point about generational is also true. I think that tendency is study hard right. and, and, and so forth, and everything would be mm -hmm. solved. Don't go for sports, don't yeah. worry about yeah. memory, <laughs> don't worry, run, yeah. don't run for, you know, yeah. for student body office. That has changed over time, but yeah. definitely, in a, a, two generations ago, it was a yeah. it was a serious issue, which was not necessarily good. Right? Yeah. Well, I have to say, for all the professions, I think architecture was the most nimble one in the sense yeah. that one could swerve towards real estate and the business side, but for us, we both swerved towards the art side. So that's in a true. way, that was the Trojan horse of our families. Right? That's true. Oh yeah, that's true. My my father said, you know, all right, all right, you have to study architecture. All right, all right. Okay. And then my grandmother was actually very supportive, amazingly, generation. And she would say, and you know, look, there's I am paid. That's why they were so yeah. amazed I actually yeah. got a job. At I am paid. <laughs> yeah. Because that was the only reason why my father relented. And then th throughout my entire life, he's always saying, you know, there's not too late to pivot towards real estate. <laughs> 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 not a doctor, not med school. No, no at that point, I figured it's that's too late, too late yeah. for me to oh, go med school. <laughs> so, stepping back though, what, what are the list of the barriers to achievement for Asian Americans in architecture?
architecture today. Mm -hmm. If you were to list the three or four things that, uh, and not necessarily ones you experienced, because you may or may not experience, but one of the reasons for having the two of you is that you know so many people in the industry, so you can make some general observations. So what a list of the barriers that you perceive that have something to do with being Asian American as opposed to you know, just generally, you know, age or whatever, right? Right. Well, you know, I'm thinking of what um, Kelvin mentioned at the time when he was at school, how many Asian students were there. And compared to my time, there were more, but not that many. Now, when I look at the South School right now, uh, the majority of foreign, the majority of the student body are comprised of uh, foreign students. Mm -hmm. And of the foreign students, the majority of my Asians. But different from 10, 20 years ago is that a lot of these uh, Asian students who hold a foreign passport, they a lot of them actually did their undergraduate here in the US. And but many of them are beginning to do the high, the high school degrees here. So although they have a foreign passport, they are actually they are quite Americanized. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, they're, so, so in a way, whereas maybe the foreign students before, I think a lot of the obstacle would be not being familiar with the American culture, with the language. It took a longer time to get acclimated. But today, I feel a lot of Asian Americans are already quite, you know, have been here for many years. You know, so that, there's that difference between those who were here recently or those who've been here for a long time. That's true. Yeah. Actually, the makeup of the Chinese American population here mm -hmm. has shifted drastically. Mm -hmm. I think the real hurdle before, it seems to me, and in my classroom, mm -hmm. they were really second and third generation Chinese American. Mm -hmm. And I think they suffer from a lack of resources. Mm -hmm. Because in current Chinese America, Chinese yeah. foreign students who may eventually naturalize or whatever, yeah. they, they come from more affluent families. Yeah. They have seen the world. Yeah. They're, mm -hmm. they're pr more, more privileged. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it goes down to this very unfair situation is upbringing and, mm -hmm. and, and perspective. Right. And the thing is that if you are, so we can't really talk about Asian Americans across the board like right. that. Yeah. It's like, how do you, and again, it's another ceiling of sort. Mm -hmm. and how do you break through your, 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 your background? Mm -hmm. How do you open your eyes? I mean, that's not just an, a, a particular race. I mean, there are people, you know, in a small town who said, I got to get the hell out of here. You know, yeah, right, because right. I want to see the world. Yeah. I think the thing for, I would encourage people who want to think about being an architect mm -hmm. is that it takes a lot more than competence. It takes perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I even I would say really opened my eyes the first time I went to a court in Europe. Yeah. You know, and and uh, but luckily I was, you know, I went there early enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a teenager. Yeah. How many people, even in regular Americans, actually go and see the world? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really important thing to yeah. to save every penny, yeah. so that you can actually yeah. experience things beyond the limitation of your own surroundings. Yes, I, I think that's a prerequisite for architecture. Absolutely, the travel is so important, mm -hmm. and experiencing a culture also beyond what the American or the Asian culture. Right? When you mentioned Europe, I actually remember. Traveling, you know, taking foreign studios was so important for me as a student. Yes. And then the point year was 1989. I was studying in Milan in the summer. Mm -hmm. And that was the summer when um, the French Open was won by Michael Chang. Mm -hmm. Right, and, I remember uh, that. Arantxa Sanchez, mm -hmm. both of them 17 year old mm -hmm. kids, unheard of. The next day at the Herald Tribune, uh, the both of them happened to be wearing Reebok at that time. Mm -hmm. So the I wrote Reebok, took an entire page. Mm -hmm. And I remember that the tagline was two 17 year olds put on their Reeboks and slay the giants. <laughs> and that was the same time uh, when the Tiananmen Square protests happened. Yes. And I remember being a, an Asian in Europe. A lot of people asked me, Are you Chinese? Are you okay? Yeah, I just right. somehow felt my identity much more mm -hmm. than being in Asia or in the exactly. US. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I suspect from yeah. what you said, mm -hmm. the, the extent that their career ceilings can vary quite a bit by mm -hmm. the type of firm, size of right. firm, even geographic location. Sounds mm -hmm. like better be on the West Coast, be so than in Chicago. Yeah. In, terms of of that. <laughs> in, ter in terms of the, the, the career ceiling issue, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I guess you should take that into consideration. Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm.
I have to say something about the middle of the country is that I would say the last um, five or six years, we witnessed that in, in the school. A lot of students who are interested in going back to where they're from in the middle of the country are not necessarily in the past always want to move to larger metropolises. Yes. They're interested in uh, public institutions, but they care about what's going to happen to their own theater in the industry. You know? So we see more and more of that focus than before, which was more one dimensional. Now, one of the things we always try to talk about is 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 change in the industry, and so many industries have actually changed quite a bit. Uh, for example, uh, being a doctor, twenty years ago, if you were a doctor, you could have an individual practice and you could watch patients, you know, take care of patients. Mm -hmm. That's really changed, mm -hmm. and it's driven the, the insurance policies and the, and the regulatory administrative things have driven so many doctors, independent doctors, to end up being employees of hospitals and so forth. So why is that relevant? It's relevant because if you're going to go to medical school, then the job that you're going to be in for the next 20 or 30 years is going to be very different than maybe your father or your friends. So with that, as you look at architecture, architecture too is going through many, many changes, mm -hmm. technology, structure, so forth, whatever. What are the changes that you see that are going to happen in going forward mm -hmm. in the next 10 or 15 yeah. years mm -hmm. and that have an impact on what your career is going to be like and specifically what your career might be like as an Asian American? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that you know for a long time architecture was sort of like a gentleman's profession you're you know it historically has been you're either employed by the pope or you're behind many chiefs you need people with deep pockets in order for you to do something and it's very top down and uh, and it focuses on you know exquisiteness of yeah. architecture for the sake of architecture mm -hmm. usually as it's there to promote religion mm -hmm. or or power mm -hmm. i think and i think that even trickled down to mm -hmm. recent years until it became a commercial commodity mm -hmm. uh, and uh in the form of real estate and all then then you really become a uh, henchman for 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 business mm -hmm. right uh, and there's always a do dollop of very super mm -hmm. wealthy people who have commissioned an amazing yeah. house, or amazing this, amazing that. Um, and of course, always underneath for the, 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 the need for civic responsibility and mm -hmm. accountability for architecture to build our environment in a peaceable, mm -hmm. sustainable way. Now with climate change, mm -hmm. I think more important than anything else, and also um especially in this country where you know we have a small government and mm -hmm. so the, the private sector has to rise to the occasion mm -hmm. to do something in order for us to balance our world i think there's a lot more opportunities that's not tagged to this kind of exclusion exclusive mm -hmm. exclusionary mm -hmm. aspect of architecture yeah. you know? I find it very, very difficult. Uh, one thing is mm -hmm. always in the beginning is to find clients mm -hmm. in the conventional sense. Mm -hmm. How do you get connections? How do you reach those wealthy yeah. people to help right. to commit you to design a house or whatever? Right. But today, that's not the only platform in the avenue yeah. to, to practice on. Mm -hmm. You can do many more things. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and are there any special considerations if you're Asian American of the long term? It sounds, sounds like the skill sets ch is changing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Your, your ability to market and find me is, mm -hmm. is becoming more important. Mm -hmm. And it's not one of those things where just because you're a talented architect, you're, you're going to get all this business. Mm -hmm. So are there any things about thinking about Asian Americans that this trend will either help or hurt or mm -hmm. things that they should do about it? I think it would help because, you know, as a minority, mm -hmm. uh, Chances of us mingling with, you know, <laughs> high power wealthy people until yeah. now has been challenging. Right. You have to create your own myth, your own brand, yeah. and you have to be very social. Yeah. And you have to be very strategic and mm -hmm. and 
all of that, which not it well, it has nothing to do with your craft. It has right. to do with your way to navigate the world. Yeah. Uh, and that to me was the hardest thing in our career. Yeah. Um, and I, what I, we're implying is that there are many more ways. We don't need to rely on, on, on that kind of Medici Pope, yeah. uh, you know, Zeckendorf's type yeah. of people to to give us a hand. And mm -hmm. we, we can actually there are many more platforms yes. to practice our potential. Mm -hmm. in, 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 and uh, I think that's that's where we. We, we can kind of strength. Now, I don't think we're changing. I think we're adding, expanding, mm -hmm. because we still have to make beautiful things. Yeah. We still have to create architecture that's, that's coherent mm -hmm. and elegant, mm -hmm. at the same time looking at sustainable materials, yeah. social, socially balanced solutions, and and all of that. Right. So in some ways, it's more challenging than ever to yes. accommodate all of that. You know, you know, one of the big changes, obviously, is, is technology. Yeah. So, you know, 20, 30 years ago, drafting was done manually, yeah. uh, so forth. Uh, and that really changed, you know, with all these computerized drafting yeah. systems, GPS systems, where you can go and measure the exact location mm -hmm. yeah. of a corner of a utility room oh, yeah. without yeah. actually. I mean, those are radical changes. How has that changed? Job, mm -hmm. but also has it either helped or hurt Asian Americans? And is there uh, something that Asian Americans should do mm -hmm. to be more valuable in that environment? Mm -hmm. You know, there's certainly a lot of changes in terms of technology. I don't know exactly how it affects the Asian American community yet, but uh, Peter, you're right. I mean, 30 years ago, everyone drafted by hand. I would say about 20, 15 years ago, computer has changed the production of architecture. Now, I think the newer technology might not necessarily change directly the production of architecture, but maybe the responsibilities of architecture. Like back then, we were trying to solve parking problems. Architects mm -hmm. were asked to solve problems. Little did we know ride sharing apps could be such some, something so revolutionary that didn't come from the realm of architecture, but begin to change our thinking. You know, architecture maybe does not have to take on all to solve all the problems, you know. Um, but I don't, I don't know in terms of how it affects Asian Americans. You know? I think it affects everyone. Yeah. In a way, it, it, we all worry about AI and all that, and the way we are as human beings. And I think there are two schools of thought. And one day, we, it's going to either going to be like, uh, you know, how, or, or it's going to help. And I think it's up to us to make, make sure that it is a tool that we can use and not something that would turn against us. Yeah. You know, and, but I, I think I think what it has done is it made our some of the tedious work that we used to do yeah. uh, so much easier, and you also you can use a lot of data to help mm -hmm. you find solutions. Um, how does that impact the Asian American? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess hard to say. No, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, after all, like spreadsheets, you know. Yeah. VisiCalc, remember yeah. VisiCalc that became uh, Excel. Uh, everybody said, well, it's going to wipe out all these people, but yeah. the reality is it didn't. It improved the quality. Mm -hmm. It probably caused them to do a lot of number scenarios that weren't worthwhile yeah. because it was so easy, mm -hmm. but it didn't change. Which my favorite question for everyone in the profession is, mm -hmm. how is chat GPT <laughs> going to affect yeah. architecture? But also, yeah. again, back to this issue of Asian Americans. Uh, in careers, mm -hmm. how should they view that in terms of having a successful career mm -hmm. uh, and give rise to the top within architecture? <laughs> well, I, I would like to add something. Um, I think the definition of success has also been changing, not necessarily only within the Asian American, but generally for the next generation. I'm looking at our students. Work-life balance is absolutely important for them. You know, so maybe some of the stereotype of when you think about Asian students being Given 150 percent, and and I think I see the younger generation seeing that not necessarily as totally helpful, you know. And they even think a lot of them consider the invention of new technology is not only to help them but also help their life to be better. You know, I do. Balance. So, yeah. yeah, and I think that then we have to kind of challenge the career itself, which is like, what is how does career fit into your overall life? And I think it's a real existential question. Mm -hmm. 
And I think once upon a time where we realize we are what we do, and we have to put our 150% into it because we're nobody, we're not status. Yeah. I think that, as you said, Mark, is changing. I think that we may not put the future generation, Asian, anyone, there's a trend yeah. towards like a career, a work career is not the be all in and all. Now, I don't know how that plays out in the long run. Uh, in terms of a highly competitive society we saw. Mm -hmm. and, um, but that we definitely see that, that trend. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, <clears throat> the other day, about a month or so ago, I was a moderator on the topic of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and careers in artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And this was not for the 24th century. And I had two leading people in AI. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tricked them. Yes. I said, oh, by the way, I've added a third panelist. Mm -hmm. And they said, really? Well, that's okay. Yeah. Three is a, more than three is, you know, yeah. you don't have a panel, whatever. So I said, I've added chat GPT <laughs> as a panelist. So I, I asked chat GPT the same question and then <laughs> added the response. And then, you know, you can do text to speech and so forth. Yeah. And it was a, it was an interesting I experience. To that. But it, it, it was, uh, was, it was amusing. Well, actually, it was extremely uh, useful because, strangely enough, ChatGPT actually gave reasonable answers. Yeah, according yeah. to the two experts, they yeah. said, you know, these are reasonable answers to this question of careers in AI. Yeah. But it was it was an amusing experience. Yeah. Well, that's the thing because we all have our own specific perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Data, information, insight—it's infinite, and if you the more you feed into the AI, the more you're able to kind of scan all the variables and then come up with some common answer. It would be kind of scary, but wonderful. But I, I think it's funny for me, uh, ChatGBT reminded me my grandmother was using the I Ching. Consult my I Ching, right? Yeah, consult my I Ching. So maybe the Chinese Americans can just consult yeah. the I Ching for their career. Yeah. What should I do for my career? And then, like, you know, no, but that was it was kind of I don't know what you've done it. But AI will have a different effect uh, in different jobs. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think there are some jobs that are severely going to be threatened mm -hmm. by the gate because AI is actually pretty good at yeah. doing that task. Architecture, not so sure, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's an element that's not just not based on. Uh, processing all this data out there, right? And there's a creative element yeah. uh, to it that, that, that maybe can't be duplicated. But it's an interesting question. Why is it relevant? Because for those uh, you know in the audience who are the, already in the architecture career or thinking about it, you've got to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I think no matter which area of architecture you want to go in, critical thinking. Yeah. Uh, that, that has nothing to do with just processing data. Yeah. And actually, you know, someone like ChatGBT is mm -hmm. fun because you can actually use it to source all kinds of information yeah. because you can, you know, and work backwards. If their answer it comes up a certain mm -hmm. way, and then you can actually go behind the answer and say, well, what did I miss? Yeah. You know, because I'm sort of like 80% there, but, mm -hmm. but they're 100% there, I think. Mm -hmm. So let's see, you know, because and then you can kind of push that even further. Right. Now, you know, it's interesting because <clears throat> in listening to everything that the two of you said over the last you know, 40 minutes or so, on one hand, you've, you've mentioned things about discrimination and career things. On the other hand, I get the impression that it's not as serious a problem in terms of career things as it, as it is in some, you know, some profession. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that's the case? And should those in the audience who are thinking are in architects, should they not worry about it? Or are there really some things you need to worry about and you you need to do something about? Mm -hmm. You know, I have to say, I, I, in the experiences, that, the things that I have been experiencing, it has been getting better and better. You know, uh, certainly not the entire country is the same. Um, certainly, there's certain areas, maybe more remote or rural areas, that, that are more challenging for Asian Americans. So uh, uh, I think supporting one another is 
very important. And, and as Kelvin mentioned, I think it's much better nowadays because we don't only have a handful of metadata, we have a lot more of them, although the projects might be smaller. So it allow one to build one's community upon themselves, whether finding the clients, whether finding the consultants that they work with. I mean, for those who uh, in the audience who are starting uh, or about thinking about starting into architecture, I think it's always good to build a community early on, you know, and be, find fellow travelers to travel with you. So true. Yeah. And I would say, again, mm -hmm. circling back to mm -hmm. what I was saying about your own emotional ceilings or psychological ceilings, those are the ones you have to break first. Mm -hmm. Because I think still there's a soupçon mm -hmm. of the tendency for Asians to be conformed. Mm -hmm. I think for architecture, yeah. You are always asked to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Really, you that's the only way you can think. Yeah. So if you want to stay within a box, mm -hmm. then you get boxed in. Yeah. Um, I would say if you want to be an architect, just find why what makes it sing for you. Yeah. Who is your end user that you feel strongly about? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And there's any kind you want to mm -hmm. who's your community? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then go for it. Now, you used to, very, in the very beginning, Alan, you talked about a good point, which is uh, self created barriers, you know, right? And I, I guess, in a sense, architecture had a lot of barriers for Asian Americans because it wasn't, quote, the accepted profession. Has that changed or not? And it was going back, instead of talking about the system of you know, discrimination or whatever, do you think with the change in generations that families, as they are talking to their sons and daughters, are, are they still having a bias against architecture relative to quote the you know, accepted or popular professions? Well, I would say architecture has never been that low, even at the point of Yeah, certainly been much more. So the competitive tactic, I'd say. Yeah, that was really, really low. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actually, I think I think nowadays a lot of the parents that, that generation see architecture as something that straddles between the arts and the sciences or the arts and business. So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a desired profession. You know, yeah, and see much more support for younger people who are trying to study architecture. I mean, this tendency, as you know, right now, schools' attendance in the arts and humanities are mm -hmm. dropping because everyone wants to go into, you know, uh, all the uh, technical, uh, you know, mm -hmm. major. So, computer science. Computer science, science. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, I think, I think this is a challenge not yeah. just for this particular social and cultural group, but everybody. Mm -hmm. And it. it and I think that, you know, I think we really need to, um, yeah, I, I really do frankly think that they have to think carefully why they want to be in any profession and in architecture particularly, because you can't be a, just like, there are no prerequisites. Like yeah. it's, that's, it's endless. You are, and therefore you can also invent yourself and create things for yourself. Right. But if you want to say, tell me what, what it is that I need to do to be an architect and I'll go there, then don't even bother. And it's interesting though, also, by the way, it's clear to me and talk, because I have many friends who are architects for some reason or other, right? <laughs> uh, but it's clear with regard to Asian Americans and Chinese Americans that I and Pei really had an impact on the acceptability. Here you had a role model and a famous one, yes. a role model. And I suspect that if I and Pei had not become this iconic, mm -hmm. you know, famous Chinese yeah. American architect, mm -hmm. that that it would have been harder for a lot of Asian Americans to either justify to their parents mm -hmm. or 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 succeed. Well, I certainly for one with, was a beneficiary of, of, of that phenomenon because mm -hmm. you know, as I said, I really leveraged, leveraged his name to give me permission to study. Now, is it true, Calvin, that you had this very thoughtful strategy and you first did acting as a ruse <laughs> to get your parents to, they said, oh, we're so glad he's an architect because you have he's not going to be an actor. <laughs> is that true that you were just, you were, you were manipulative and, uh, and vicious? That and could have, 
<laughs> now that you tell me, I could have. It could have been, right? But I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and instead, I had a on a tire. I should have. Well, you know, I'm so I'm a is a trailblazer for yeah. so many people in the world. I would say also American architecture education. Uh, there's a certain degree of professionalism compared to, let's say, a school in Italy, mm -hmm. where an architecture class would be there could be a thousand people yeah. in a school of architecture per class. But oftentimes, they don't intend to be architects. They they they, they take it as if it's a liberal arts education to uh, prepare for for something, for something yeah. else, you know. And and I think. Uh, an early question about no matter how technology changes, it might change the process, but for our profession, at the end, there's always the physical building, there's always the physical space, you know. So, that thing being very haptic or stays constant, like for us, we still have physical models, although we use yes. computation. So, right. I think that aspect of, of the hapticness and the physicality of the building uh, will always be the end. Yeah. Now, we have a number of questions. I haven't yeah. read them yet. So oh, we've sure. got five or six. But before we go to questions, though, I'm going to ask each of you to follow. You know the uh, the the, uh, the famous film? Oh, God. They said, Not they that said one. Plastics, right? You know, Mrs. Robinson. Oh, so I don't know. That guys, one. I only, have, I only yeah. have one word to, uh, yeah. to, to give you in plastic. So similarly, for the Asian Americans, right. specifically with the Asian Americans who are in the audience here, Simple sentence, what advice would you give to them to be successful as yeah. an Asian American as yeah. an architect? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that I would give you only easy questions, right? I, I would say it's very important to integrate with other communities. Yeah. I think mean, oftentimes I see a lot of young Asian American architects who found the opportunities within the Asian community, which is great, and they support each other. Oftentimes they stay within the Asian community. And I think to, to grow, to expand is important at the outset to also open to other type of communities. Yes. Yeah. Similar, I would say widen your horizon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. did, uh, did the two of you have specifically had mentors that helped you along the way and were they accidental or on purpose mentors on your on purpose on your part? Other than I am, mm -hmm. he would be the one. I mean, I mean, he kicked me out of his office mm -hmm. because he said, you know, you're not meant to be in a big firm. Yeah. You're not even meant to be in someone else's firm. You, you've done what you've done. You've been here for six years. Now go out and do your thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that many of my teachers were important, you know, teachers at USC, also uh, Jorge Civetti, who oh, was, sorry. Who was yeah. a, a friend and a colleague and, and, a, and also a Oh, too. Yes. He recently retired as a professor at, at Harvard. Mm -hmm. He's a mentor to you know, many. You know. Yeah, and it's very important. Yeah. One of the things that we've heard time and time again in these webcasts is uh, is to find a mentor. Yeah. And I think this is a universal truth. Mm -hmm. The problem is a lot of people, they say, oh, but there are no Chinese Americans or Asian Americans yeah. who to be mentor with. It shouldn't matter. The mentor yeah. could be, you know, any ethnicity, whatever, but yes. you've got to find a mentor because you need to push yourself up, but someone needs to help pull you up as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you don't have some people fighting for you above you, then you're at a disadvantage. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, I, I think this uh, mentorship is also about having a role model. Exactly. Right? And it could be a very quiet and silent role model. Yeah. And just being able to be visible, you see them being there doing that gives you the full credit. Right. Now, I'm going to read through these questions. The, the only disadvantage, of course, is the lettering is very small on this laptop. So I'm going to try to read that. So, uh, Grace Wing just says, who are your favorite architects, Asian American or in general? <laughs> That's all we always ask. You know. <laughs> For me, I am Pei and Fung Hu to Monkey are two Asian Americans in, that fits into this gentleman architecture, architect mode. I also love the work of Arnold Caesar as a Portuguese architect. God, you know, you have to, we have the same people. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Caesar. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Portuguese. See, yeah. it could have made a lot easier to have one panelist because the two of them are so similar, right? It would have been a lot easier to only ask one question, right? Uh, so the next question. Now, uh, here, here, here is a question related to this, this, this topic. 
what soft qualification skills that we currently don't focus on or should be focusing on, so soft skills. And that partly relates to Asian Americans because yeah. I think the soft skills of Asian Americans are not the same as you know traditional Caucasian or other. Yeah. Well, I would say like in my office, for example, uh, when we hire someone, you know, regardless of their skills, I think my partner and I are looking for people that are tough on issues or tough on work, but soft on people. And that that type fits us really well. The worst is the kind that are tough on people <laughs> and soft on issues. <laughs> well, that's yeah. sure. so you don't want any Captain Queeks, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, soft uh, skills, listening. Yeah. I, yeah. you know, I think it's the foundation of all because you're you're soft on people because you care. You right. care because you're attentive, mm -hmm. and so you listen to people, and then you learn mm -hmm. a lot more yeah. about whatever. And then you can be tough on the yeah. situation because exactly. you know. You have insight. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, this one is a very long question that is very difficult to summarize. Oh, there is one just technical question someone asked here, which I can answer, which is Is this program for Asian Americans? Do we also consider Indian Americans? And the answer is yes. Yeah. And also, one of the things, the challenging things, is everyone lumps Asian Americans together. Mm -hmm. but the reality is, there's, we have some as many differences between uh, South Asians and East Asians, Indian Americans versus Chinese Americans, mm -hmm. as there are between Caucasians, et cetera. Yeah, that's right. And that's something to consider. Very complex, mm -hmm. and it's been a topic of a lot of discussion mm -hmm. from a lot of the panels we've had about. Yeah. The differences and yeah. you know, for example yeah. why we have so many indian american ceos mm -hmm. and that's an interesting question right mm -hmm. uh, for example um so here oh here's a question from lily chen who's a committee 100 member mm -hmm. so i am pay personally told me that calvin was his favorite what because he always put the better in our community first so how did IMP influence your view on the community, which I, I think is a question for you and not Mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, what, what was the question again? IMP personally told me, yeah. Lily Chen, uh -huh. that Calvin was his favorite because he always put the betterment of our community first. How has IMP influenced your view on the community? Well, I mean, the thing is, I am doesn't influence people. I am doing do it by example, right? So he is generous. He's compassionate. He he puts other people first. Uh, I think his success with his clients is because he is not just charismatic. Of course, he was. Uh, he he he's always very very. Um, trying to be as empathetic towards people as possible, mm -hmm. not just to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, he's always been regaling me of mm -hmm. our role, my our role as role models. Right. He, does, he did say, you know, you know, Calvin, mm -hmm. we are a very rare be breed of someone mm -hmm. in our profession. And you have to remember that. Yeah. And that you are being, people are looking on, you know, mm -hmm. not looking up to you, but looking to you. Yeah. Uh, and and so, you know, be always very mindful and be careful, you know, be, be um, generous. You know? So this last question here actually is a very good question. And it's from, oh, now I got another one. I, oh, we got some more. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, as I was speaking, there are more questions. Uh, so uh, here's one, which I hope to be able to scroll up. So Scott Wing says, I'm a 74-year-old successful Asian American architect. I want to know what we can do to build diverse diversity in the big firms. I was on the AIA National Diversity Committee in 1995 and worked for many of the big firms and worked with IMP on the UCLA Medical Center. 
but believe the big firms are still very discriminatory against Asians. What can we do? Hmm. Thank you, Scott, for that question. Well, you know, I was thinking yeah. that even on five firms, yeah. I don't see that that as very evident. Yeah. You know, like at KPF, why so on. Right. There are a lot of Asian Asians working there that are very uh, yeah. in very very responsible roles. So, but I wouldn't know anything about them in the well, I mean, I'll speak for Harvard Graduate School of Design, which is as, as large as a large office, a, a corporate office. Yes, yeah, right. Uh, and certainly, there are times when, like doing Black Lives Matter, you you know, try to hire more African American architects together mm -hmm. with recruiting more yeah. African American mm -hmm. students. Now, a lot of the African American architects who came before they came, they said, "Well, I would well, I'd love to teach, but I don't feel adequate enough, or I don't feel like I want to address Black Lives Matter as an issue, although although it's a, a lighting one." Uh, but I said, "You don't worry. Just be there. Just come and be an architect. You know, mm -hmm. just be a role model that way. I think your presence makes a difference." Mm -hmm. And and I think sometimes. Uh, same thing with Asian Americans. Sometimes it's the presence of them. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, they they could be in the office. Those who are in leadership position. If we if one can give more opportunities and whether they address their role or not, just the presence in the office, I think makes a huge difference. That is so true. Yeah. In the sense that we all have a responsibility, whether where the ceilings are, yeah. it doesn't matter. We are there, mm -hmm. and we step by step, people will be, mm -hmm. you know. Sitting, standing on our shoulders, yeah. and that's the only way we can exact change. Not by making demands or or negotiate, but just be the best that we can. Yeah. Well, it's it's going to be very very you know interesting, and I think architecture is going to go through a lot of change. But it'll be interesting. This is not directly related to Asian American, but I I know that one of the impressions that people have about architecture is a little like the music profession, which is Hard to make a living, right? right. Yeah, hard to make a living. Uh, I once was moderating a panel on architectural careers about seven or eight years ago, and and one of the panelists uh, raised her hand right at the beginning. She says, "If anyone wants to ask the question, how do you get rich? <laughs> if you're an architect, the answer is marry someone rich." <laughs> no, so <laughs> so that question is: it still true that structurally it just hard Certainly, at the beginning and mid level, mm -hmm. and is that something that you know you should think about, even though it's really not an Asian American I issue? But right. Well, I think what I kind of talked about earlier, in the sense that there are more clients out there, there's not only a few clients, opens up the field a lot. But at the same time, uh, the difficulty is of not having one or two big clients that are constant clients that everyone fight for is that the clients are not always recurring clients. That have the same project. So oftentimes you could have a long career, but still you have to be interviewed. You have to present Hustle, yourself right. again. So yeah. 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 another yeah. one is that yeah. we're a service industry, yeah. Yeah. but unlike the law profession, mm -hmm. we, you know, we were trapped by the mm -hmm. comp and, and the, the annoying thing called competition. We are pitted against each other mm -hmm. for for the jobs. I really think that they should eliminate competition. Mm -hmm. Because it sets a very bad precedent. Because clients think I can, you know, you guys can go fight for yourself, light it out, and I'll get the, you know, the wins. And, yeah. and, uh, and that, to me, is a, a tradition mm -hmm. that I hope would change one day. Yeah. Now, in Europe, for example, um, we they don't re like in Germany anyway. Yeah. I remember we did projects there. The fees were set by by government right. ruling. So. They're not going to negotiate up and down. Yes. In this country, you know, it's like it's a con contest. It's, it's every a time con con yeah. So there, in order to get the job, mm -hmm. you have to kind of like cut yourself so lean yes. that at the end of the day, if you if you break even, you're even happy. Or it's like yes. you live with very modest income. Well, you know, if I may, add, just in a smaller scale, my experience in Europe is that I was astonished when I went there. I lived in Switzerland. That the houses there, it's like three times the construction costs of what it is here. But then I also was astonished that someone in their thirties or forties would commission a house, they plan to live there forever, mm. and pass it on to their children. Whereas in the U.S., it's much more about upward mobility. I mm. want to live three or five years. I move. I want to sell. I want to move to a better place. 
And, and I realized there that it was the tax structure there that oftentimes in many cantons, you've actually pay more for this neighborhood tax than the, than the federal tax. So if they want to build a new kingdom garden, they vote to raise the tax. They want to build a new road, they vote to raise it. And I can imagine if I think I pay for the kingdom garden, I pay for the road, why do I want to move to the next neighborhood? Right, you know, exactly. So this whole sense of permanence is much more conductive, or this sense of better built architecture is much more conductive. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. we've reached the official hour yeah. of the panel, and uh, now I'm going to move a lot of the audience into, you know, into a, a networking, I hope. But uh, I want to really thank uh, our two panelists. Uh, this is a kind of a tricky topic, but, the, but I think there are clearly some real lessons here mm -hmm. for, the, for the audience. And it sounds like it's maybe less challenging than some professions in terms of a, a discrimination against Asian Americans, but but uh, but but uh, more than others. But also, as Calvin was saying, may, some of the barriers may well be self-created barriers rather than societal or, or systemic yeah. barriers. And that's, I think, a lesson for all of you who are mm -hmm. thinking of career in. That you ought to think not just about what the society or the structure is imposing on you, right. but are you yourself mm -hmm. uh, or your family yeah. creating a barrier? So thank you very much, and I'm going to make an attempt, which may or may not succeed, in bringing all of you uh, into a networking session. Uh, hopefully, it'll work. Okay.